Good morning and welcome to Tuesday Truth or Treasure. My name is Leticia and I'm so happy that you're here with me today. Um, today we're going to talk about, well for the past couple of weeks we've been talking about some leadership examples in the Bible and today we are changing it up a little bit. Um, partially because I usually talk about the things that are going on with me and uh, topics that actually are helping me. So as I'm studying them with you, I'm getting them for myself. And this week I've been struggling, well, I've been struggling with something and God spoke to me specifically about something uh, yesterday and I wanna talk about that. So today we are going to talk about the truth about worry. Um, so before we get started, let's uh, say a prayer and begin. Heavenly Father, Oh, Lord, we thank you because we can come to you at any time of the day or the night. We come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. We come boldly into your presence because we know that we can. Thank you. Thank you for making us citizens of heaven. Thank you for making us heirs jointly with Christ. Thank you for allowing us this privilege to study your word, to come to you, to ask. And thank you most of all, for letting us cast our anxiety and our cares on you because we know that your yoke is light. Lord, I pray that we can lay it all down, lay it all down at your feet today, that we not worry, that we not obsess about what's gonna happen tomorrow, what's not gonna happen, or what answer we're waiting for, or any of that, that we could focus on learning more about you, that we can truly cast our cares on you, and that we can take with us the peace that surpasses understanding that only you can give. Lord, help us grow, help us learn. Let me say only what you would have me to say. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so we're gonna talk about <clears throat> worry. And, um, <coughs> I would not say that I get um, necessarily lost in a pit of worry, but it's almost like, uh, and I, I mean, I think, I don't know, I'm just gonna say what I'm, what I'm, how I'm feeling it and how I'm experiencing it, and if it relates with you, then it relates with you. So it, I would be lying if I said that I didn't worry about things at some point um, that a thought might enter my mind. Uh, but just like a hotel lobby, and I love this example uh, that I heard a, a pastor say one time, just like a hotel lobby, you're gonna have thoughts that kind of come into your mind all the time, sort of like in a hotel lobby, how things are coming and going, people are coming and going, there's a lot of activity. But what you don't wanna do is give that thought a room, check it into room 512, and then just leave, let it be there and let it fester and let it grow, and then you begin to obsess, and then you get the, you know into a deep depression, and I mean, it just goes on and on and on. You don't wanna do that. If the thought comes, you rebuke that thought. You take that thought captive. You deal with that thought and you not let it progress further because a lot of times the enemy puts these thoughts in us. And so I will be fine one minute. Everything's good. I have faith. God's going to provide. Things are going great. And then the very next moment, you know, the light bulb will come in and I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do about this light bulb? You know, and I get really crazy in my thoughts again. So I have to remember. So this is like a daily thing that that goes on. I'm, I know I'm probably, um, I probably noodle a lot. Uh, not everybody's a noodler. I am. I'm just being honest. So I'm kind of constantly squirreling in my mind and I have to consciously stop myself. So um, to not do that and to really... Uh, take these thoughts captive and um, control them and replace them with promises from God. That's why I love my Tuesday treasure day. <laughs> I love it because I get to talk about uh, truths and treasures from the Bible. So anyway, without further ado, let's turn to Matthew 6 and we're going to read from 25 to 34. <clears throat> Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds from the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See, see how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. <clears throat> Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So worry is defined as a verb or a noun. When it's defined as a verb, it's a give, give away, it gives away to anxiety or an ease, allows one's mind to dwell on difficulty or trouble. Listen to that. Allow to worry is to allow one's mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. Even in the in the definition that just kind of spoke to me just even right now, how worry is allowing your mind to do that. Wow. A noun, worry as a noun, is a state of anxiety or uncertainty over actual or potential problems. So when you're worrying, you're sort of like sitting in a rocking chair. I mean, it, you, it's giving you something to do, but you're not going anywhere. You're not doing anything. And it's not productive. It's just uh, a pastime. Just because you're moving, just because you're doing things, doesn't mean you're actually being productive. Um now, what are the things that we worry about? I mean, it could be anything. If you're a constant worrier, really, it could be anything. But if you if you sat down and bucketized the things that we usually worry about, it's something in the past, something that can't ever be rectified because it's already been done. But we worry about what we said, what we should have said. I should have said it like this. I didn't do it like that. Why didn't that happen? Oh, my goodness. What if that wouldn't have happened and this would have happened just it's something that has already been done and said we can't do anything about it but yet we worry about it anyway we worry about the present over things which with where we have no control i'm sorry the present where we things are out of our control now there's some things that are in our control but this is worrying about things that are not in our control like the hurricane coming <laughs> You know, we cannot project the path of the hurricane. Uh, we don't, you know, or, or it, like those kind of disasters. You're worrying about something that it's not even happened yet. You have no control over it. And the other thing that we worry about is something in the future that may never come to pass. Uh, right now, my daughter is applying to schools um, and things like that. Or And so I'm worried, what if she never gets accepted? Which obviously she will. Uh, the other thing I worry, what if I never get a job? because I'm unemployed right now. So what if I never get a job? What if I can't pay my bill? What if I lose my house? What if I, you see how it just, like it's almost like a soundtrack and it just, it goes from one thing to the worst case scenario. You know, <clears throat> what if I lose my house? Where will we live? What do we live under the bridge? I mean, it just, honestly, it goes on and on. <laughs> it, it actually sounds pretty silly to say them out loud and to record them and to admit them, <laughs> these crazy thoughts. Um, but studies show that 85%, stop and think about that, 85% of the things that we worry about, they never happen. So why do we worry? It does, I don't know. We still do it. Still do it. But God doesn't just frown upon us worrying. He doesn't just like, oh, you know, cute little Leticia worrying. No, he forbids us. And we're supposed to, I want to cover principles that'll help you understand why you shouldn't worry. And they're all from this little section of the Bible. So number one is that it's foolish to worry. It's foolish. He encourages us in this passage, look at the birds. Let me see where it says, where that part is. Look at the birds, verse 26 of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns or hoard toilet paper. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? 
So he says, hey, they don't plant crops. They don't gather a harvest. They don't grab all this stuff and hoard it for later. They, he just feeds them. They don't, um, they, they don't, they don't uh, stop and, and, you know, have a bird convention and put all the little, you know, bird food in a certain spot just in case they never have food again. No, they're transient. They're moving from place to place and they just know that they're going to be taken care of. And he asks, aren't you more valuable than them? And he, if you think about the example, he doesn't say, like, there's so many birds, right? I'm not necessarily a bird person. Um, sorry if you are a bird person, but... Um, he doesn't say like when I think of a of like, like a grand majestic bird, I might you might think of like a soaring bald eagle or you know just like a massive beautiful bird. But he doesn't say that. He he says a little bird. <laughs> you know, it's just like hey, look at the birds. It's it's it doesn't even call it by name. It's just like any bird. You know, it it, it a, the, any bird, a little bird, not not necessarily a bald eagle, just any bird, any old sparrow, any old crow, anything. Um, it, he cares for that bird, wouldn't he also care for you? Like if he cares for that little bird, would not he also care for you? Of course he would, right? because you're more valuable than them. So <clears throat> it is foolish to worry. The next thing is it is futile. It is, um, it accomplishes nothing. It is futile to worry. It's, it's useless. That's a better word. It's useless to worry. It accomplishes nothing nothing absolutely nothing you don't add extra extra time to your life it doesn't improve your reputation it does nothing and <clears throat> our days on this earth are, they're already numbered even before we were born they were already numbered the bible says that so why do we worry why do we worry about them we try to a lot of times maybe worry toward a solution or what will happen when or or how uh you know, let's hurry up before, you know, I got to hurry up and do this before this or, you know, I'm, I'm doing that all the time. Uh, I worried when my kids were little, I always worried about like the next phase in their development. Like when they were babies, I worried that I would never be able to wean them. Well, I worried that they would never stop sleeping in the bed with me. I worried that I'd never be able to wean them. I'd worried, what if they never learn how to walk? Then I worried, what if I never can potty train them? What if they never learn how to read? I mean, you see, I'm I'm not even to that step and I'm already worrying about the next step, which it was useless because it was a natural progression. It was happening anyway. Now I'm not saying you're not concerned, you're not working toward, you're not, it's different than worry. Um, these, you can see by what the things that I was thinking about at the time in my life, I was just, it was almost just like a way to keep busy. And, and you know, when the kids started walking, when kids started walking, I didn't have to worry about that. I just inserted the very next worry and moved right along, uh, just worrying about the very next thing. And we shouldn't be like that. If you think about the Bible and when we're looking, reading the Bible, not once in the Gospels do we hear uh, Jesus say, let's go, let's hurry up, or we're going to miss this miracle. We got to hurry up and make it happen. No. There's never that sense of hurry and worry that you're going to miss something because God is an on-time God. So though you have a need and things may be, um, you know, building up and you're getting close to a deadline. And that's, I think, a lot of times when we start to worry, like, Lord, this is about to happen and I need you to work right now. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, mortgage is coming due or this bill's coming due or my my worries right now a lot of them are financial so that's my example sorry but you know my my kids a university or you know getting accepted just any insert your own worry there um <clears throat> but the thing is we're not accomplishing anything um by doing it it's absolutely useless absolutely useless it accomplishes nothing absolutely nothing think about the sunrise we have to wait for the sunrise. We can't hurry it up. It doesn't rise any sooner if we worried about it. <laughs> we're not making it, uh, it doesn't rise any sooner because it knows we're watching. It just rises because it's time for it to rise. You can count on it. You don't have to wait in vain for the sun. You don't have to wait for it. God's faithful. It just comes up. It's just there. So, Worry is not only foolish to do, because just as he takes care of the birds, he'll take care of us. It's also 
useless to do because you're accomplishing nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, <clears throat> third thing is that it is frustrating to worry. Worry causes frustration. He talks about the lilies of the field that neither toil nor spin. They don't worry about they're going to wear or punch a time clock. Think about how they grow. I mean, how they grow, it's really, it's a mystery. We have no idea how it grows. It just happens. A caterpillar turns into a butterfly. How? It doesn't worry about will I ever become a butterfly. It's, it doesn't. It just, God does it. These little animals in his hands, they're free because they can just move on to the next thing. With it's don't have to be frustrated about this next phase. They just they're worry free. And so it's frustrating to worry because you are trying to stop a uh, a process that that is under God's control. The last thing and probably the thing that convicts me the absolute most um because the other things i feel like you know it's foolish you're I'm being dumb it's useless it's frustrating they're like for me like it's it doesn't feel <clears throat> this last reason feels um insulting i don't want to insult god but it's faithless to worry it is absolutely faithless because when you're worrying, what you're basically saying is, I don't trust God what you said in the Bible for me. I do not trust that you're going to take care of me. So I have to worry about it because I can't trust your word. So when we say that, we're basically calling God a liar. We're saying that we can't trust that he's going to provide our every need. We're saying that we can't trust that he's going to clothe us like he clothes the lilies of the field. We're saying that he's not going to take care of us. So we have to worry because we feel like that. So it's absolutely faithless. It's a lack of faith in God's promise to protect his people, to provide for his people. It it really, it reveals a lack of trust in God and in his promises. I mean, do you trust the Bible? That's what I tell myself. Like, what are you doing? If you say that God is your provider, why are you worried? There's no reason. There's no reason. And the thing is that faith and worry are reactions to the events in our life. But if our life is governed by scripture and we have scripture in our heart, then everything that comes in, every thought that comes in, we need to have a scripture to attack it. So the the key is we don't need to worry. But the very next question, the very next question, if you are a worrier, so there's you know bound to be somebody who's worrying, um, you say, How? How can I do this? How can I not worry? How? Well, <clears throat> I have two passages that I want to read. One is from Joshua 1, 1 to 9, and the other one is from Psalm 1, 1 to 3. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross the Jordan, you and all my people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your feet treads, I have given to you, just as I spoke to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, as far as the great sea towards the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I've been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
In Psalm 1, 1 to 3 says, How blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit at the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. So both of these passages talk about how to be successful, how to be successful in life. And in both of them, there is, there's a, a meditation on the Lord day and night. So how do you not worry? You meditate. Now, what is meditation? If you think about Eastern meditation, they attempt to empty your mind, to sit there and you're just, you know, mm, you know, kind of chanting some random thing and emptying your mind, trying to reach a certain level, which is absolutely ridiculous. I don't even know how people can do that. I, I could never do that. Um, so that's, that is not what I'm talking about when I say meditate. How do you stop worrying by meditate? How not, that's not the meditation I'm talking about. Western meditation, now that's Eastern meditation. Western meditation is intellectual. So it's getting into your brain, into your thoughts. It's, you know, it's an intellectual uh, reasoning behind, which also would not work for me because my thoughts we know are a little bit psycho sometimes. <laughs> I cannot count on my own thoughts. Uh, what I'm talking about, how you eliminate worry, is by bi biblical meditation. And what that is, is an ongoing encounter with God. It is, we start to meditate on God. Now, what specifically, what do we meditate on? We meditate on the word of God. What did he say about our situation? So whatever situation that we are going through, I encourage you, look for scriptures in the Bible on that particular situation. And Google is so easy. Like, there's literally no excuse. You could put verses about money, verses about sadness, verses about hope, verses about identity, verses about, really, verses about anything. And fill in the blank. And verses will just pop up from, from Google and give you all these verses that you can see. And then go back to the Bible and look for them. And you, once you're in the Bible, you you uh will see reference to other verses it'll kind of lead you lead you on but just for example psalm 103 17 and 18 says but the love of the lord remains forever with those who fear him his salvation extends to his children's children and of those who are faithful to his covenant of those who obey his commandments so when i worry about my son and my son's what if my son is never uh, saved and I worry about his salvation, I, I go to this verse because this verse says, the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children of those who are faithful to his covenant. I love that. I love that promise for me. So when I'm worrying about my son or a thought comes in about my son, I automatically think about this verse in Psalm 103, 17 and 18. When I'm worried about something that might have happened or my future, you know, all that, you know, I get whatever. I, I think about Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So I think about that verse, that me getting laid off, me, uh, all the things that I've gone through just recently, that all these things are working together to accomplish something good. God's going to use them for my good. Though may, they may not all be good, God will use them all for my good. Um... <clears throat> when I am praying and it seems like nothing is happening or I'm, you know, in a dry, in a dry place, just like the Rosha talked about a couple weeks ago. I remember James 5, 16. I remember that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces results. His word says it. So if his word says it, I believe it. So one of the, one of the things that you can meditate on is when you're worrying or wanting to worry about something is what did God say about the situation? What did he say about it? If it's money, if it's anything, insert your worry. Okay. Cause we're, we are not all thinking about the same thing. We are not all going through the same thing. But I promise you that you're, whatever it is you're going through, the Bible has a verse for it. It has a story about it and it covers it. I think a lot of times we think our situation is so unique. No one's 
ever gone through this before and that's not true because there's nothing new under the sun things this is an instruction manual for our life so we can depend on it and we can find something in here that'll help us guide us through life so the other thing that we can meditate on so the word of god we can meditate on the ways of god his mercy his goodness his kindness his gentleness the concerns of the world I think about everything that's going on in this world and he still cares about me. I mean, it just blows my mind. And at one point I I had um, written down this note. So this is why it's important to write down things when you feel God's presence or when you feel like he's speaking to you. And I had this note from June 28th, uh, 2018. It says, the birds are singing this morning. Every morning I've been hearing them sing. They are so consistent with their praise. And the Bible promises that if he takes care of the sparrow, won't he also take care of us? And today I thought, if the sparrow sings so consistently every morning, why shouldn't I? I just, when I started thinking about um, the ways of God, his mercy, his goodness, his kindness, his gentleness, the attributes of God and how he is. Um, there was a one point where I was um, nervous when we first moved into this house that the paperwork couldn't go through. We'd already moved into the house. There was a snag about something. <clears throat> they just rent it for a couple of days and then we, the, until the buy, you know, until the actual purchase went through. And I started thinking maybe we would have a problem with the purchase because there was some issue that came up. And I started getting really nervous. And then I thought, I, st I stopped. And I thought, God is not going to move you into this house, confirm to you that this is the house that you're going to get, bless you with the new school district for your kids to go to school, bless you with this this house is like a dream house with a dream layout with these awesome bookcase behind me. <laughs> He's not going to bless you with all this. Have you move in here, live here for 10 days, and then say, bye, sucker, you couldn't afford it after all. <laughs> He's not going to do that. That is not God, you see. So when I'm worrying about something, um, I just, I stop and I think. He's not going to do all that. Just like right now, I think he wouldn't have... He wouldn't have given me this house. He wouldn't have given me my car. He wouldn't have given me all these things. To just take them from me because I don't have a job. <laughs> he wouldn't have done that. So there must be something else. So when I start to work, I think about the goodness of God. I think about his ways. And the last thing, I think about the works of God and what he's done for me before, how he's provided for me before, how he's, how he's been there for me and provided for even the smallest things. And I actually have a really great example that happened yesterday. I was on my way in the morning to go pick up some groceries that I ordered from H-E-B and um, I, I ordered the groceries, I went in and I you know, was waiting in the curbside to get them and the girl comes and delivers them and then I had a watermelon and she says, do you want me to put the watermelon up front? And I said, yeah. And then I thought, uh, I don't want her to have to walk all the way to the front and put the watermelon in, you know, just okay. And so I said, it's okay, just put it in the back, it's no big deal. And, and she said to me, I'm trying to make her life easier. <laughs> That's why I said that. And she says, are you sure? Um, because if I leave it back here, it's going to roll around. And it might mess up your bread and your other groceries. Are you sure? I don't mind bringing it to the front. And I said, okay. So she comes and brings it to the front, you know, as my passenger side. I had my a watermelon from my passenger. and But the watermelon didn't roll and it stays safe. And I didn't think anything of it. But right after that, I went to Panera. And my kids like these um, Asiago cheese bagels. And so they usually eat one every morning. I split one with them. So they eat half of a bagel every morning. It's just, 
you know, they just like it. So I usually get five, one for every day of the week, and then I split it in half with them so that they eat half of this bagel every morning. Um, so I just, I've done this so many times. The bagels are $1.50, um, so they're not that expensive. And I buy five uh, for, the, for the week. In my mind, it's for the week. I buy five. I've done this many times, many, many times. Um, so I ordered the five, and then um, the girl says, are you sure you don't want to do half a dozen? Um, if you buy half a dozen, it's cheaper than if you buy five. And I don't know why I didn't know that. I never paid attention. I just thought they're $1.50, so I wasn't paying attention. And But sure enough, they're $1.50, five, that's seven fifty, dollars And um, it was six ninety nine for six. I didn't even know that. <clears throat> so it was like, 50 cents cheaper and I got an extra bagel which is great um I said yeah sure and I got to the window and she gave it to me and I told her thanks no one's ever told me that before and I thanked her and I know these are silly examples but as I was pulling out of Panera I'm telling you that the Lord told me I just felt it in my spirit so strong if I care about your groceries, if I care enough to not let a watermelon squanch up your bread and the rest of your groceries, and I care enough about you saving a dollar fifty on your little bagel, you don't think I know that your mortgage is coming up or your car payment is due or that you don't have a job? I know that. Don't worry. Trust me. And it just really, it gave me a lot of peace. And it also convicted me and it also made me laugh. <laughs> because see, the way God speaks to me is going to be totally different than maybe the way he speaks to you. But this, the way I, I, I know that was him talking to me. I know that that was, I know that, I know that. It's like, don't worry. I care about these little things. It's like, he cares about the bird. Don't you think I care about the big things too? If I care about these little things, don't you think I care about the big things? And he does. So the way that you meditate on God, the way you have biblical meditation is, is number one, to focus on what God said about the situation. Find verses, find Bible, scripture, find it. So that you, when you're thinking, when a thought comes into your mind, and you want to go crazy on that thought, you say, no, what if I never get a job? No, my God will provide all my needs. What if I get a job? I can do all things in Christ. What if I never, you, you just, you have scripture to battle every single thought that might, that the enemy might be trying to put in there. You, because you know that God has a plan for your future. You know that he causes all things to work together. You know that he directs your past. You know that you, you may go one way, but God has a, has the final say in your life. So I know scripture after scripture, so I will start saying them. I start going crazy. I'm like, I know the plans that he has for me. I know I can do all things through Christ. I know this. I know I'll be successful in all I do. So I don't need to worry. And then I also focus on the ways of God in every single attribute. I focus on his goodness, his mercy, his kindness. It's not consistent with his nature for him to put me in a situation and then be like, okay, figure it out now. Bye. Gotta go. He's not going to do that. He's not going to do that to me because he's a good, good father. He's your father. He's your Abba. He's your daddy. He's not going to do that. And then I focus on the works of God and what he's done for me before. And because I had such a good example from yesterday, um, I have it and I wrote it down. But there's many examples that I have where he's come through again and again and again for me. And when I'm starting to worry, I go back and I look through my examples and I read them and I remember, hey, God is with me. So when you are a person that is meditating on what the word of God says, you don't go through these periods of drought. During, during a drought, if you think about it, the trees that are planted along a riverbed have no idea that there's a drought because for them, there's never been one. So if you are a tree that is firmly planted by a riverbed, you have no idea there's a drought because there's always going to be enough water for you. See, so it could be a drought for everybody else. Just like 2020 could have been a big fat mess for everybody else. But for you, it doesn't have to be like that. So I want you to consider that. I want you to think about that. So what do you do in the meantime? You praise. You pray, you praise, and you give thanksgiving. You 
praise God. You rejoice in what he's already done. You give him the praise. Philippians 4, 49 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evidence to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all. All understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So see, verse 7 says the peace of God. God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart. But then verse 9 says, the God of peace will be with you. So our key to do is to meditate on his word. Meditate on what it says about your situation. Think about what he's done for you before. Think about the goodness and the attributes of God. Think about his ways. Think about that. And then give thanks and rejoice. He is not a man that he would lie. If he is giving you a promise, you need to know that he is going to fulfill it. He's not a liar. So we just give thanks before. I give thanks for my job. I give thanks for my provision. I give thanks for this house, for my health, for my kids, for the future that he's making for them, for their future spouses. I give thanks for all of that because we serve a good, good God. And when we do, it is useless to worry, absolutely useless. I hope today helped you. I hope that uh, you will stop, read these sections of scripture again, find more verses on worry, meditate. If you're struggling with this, you don't need to because God promises that he will be your provider. He will be your, he will be your provision. He is your healer. He's your comforter. He's your teacher. He is the great I am, which means he is anything that you need. And you, all you need to do is call on him today. I'll see you guys next week. Make sure you tune in for the rest of the week and watch the other scripture sisters. Talk to you later. Bye.